Surrey 105 festival for up there and he's a geologist today and uh, he's going to help us understand the the dating and the chronology of the 105 uh, site um, and so we'll talk to him and get a better understanding of what it is that he does what he's doing here um, and it's learned something new man I am Tebucho Vincent Makwela a geologist and lecturer at the University of Johannesburg in the Department of Geology. I have been working in the Rising Star for some time now. I completed my PhD here and now I am back in Cave Chamber 105 to do some interesting studies there. Mainly it will be the dating of the new deposits that we have found which have some very interesting fossils and trying to figure out uh, the cave geology uh, which seems to be a bit complex at the moment. Okay, so yeah, we had a shear zone here. Definitely that's what caused the collapse so easily. Okay. I'll come back to that side. But look at how we have the, the sheared country zone in, be well, completely inside the, the flow stone. You see that? Mm. Even here as well, yeah. it's the same thing, flow stone. So that relationship is going to be very interesting in helping us understand what exactly happened, uh, particularly now with the falling of these large blocks mm. that we see behind us. Um, because that, well, firstly, it's the country rock. So it's the local rock that is the oldest here. Mm. But the shearing that we see in it happened before the, the flow stone formation oh yes, yes you know yeah. so that means that all these it's infilling flow stone mm. finding uh, the 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 shared zones in between the the fractures that mm. resulted and filling them later on yeah you know so, and so that should actually be help us understand the... all this yeah 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 is this that this is not that Milanite? Yeah, it is. It, it, it is. It is, okay. yes, yeah. Because, yeah. The one that uh, Pedro uh, studied and dated with Adenagon. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. You know? Okay, so it is that crushed dolomite. Uh, That's right, basically. yes, yeah. yeah. Okay. So you, if, if you date this flowstone, you might be able to get a date on when the the shearing happened no when the shearing happened we know but that's proterozoic oh okay yes, yeah. true, yes. that's very old oh, okay now yeah, you can clearly really see where this connected to the roof yeah, as exactly. well so that yeah. whole thing just mm. okay. so it may actually have been as a result of the mining mm. that may have been attached there yes and that wall would have been through there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And these entablets could have been filled with this flow stone. Yes. With, um, and well, they, the, I think they, they, they used to be chunks. a lot more close than there. Yes. So yeah. they obviously mined everything yes, yeah. off. So it may actually have been as a result of the, the fall, yeah, yeah, as a yeah, result yeah. of the mining, yeah. as they were removing the flow stone that ran down mm. yeah, exactly. this wall. Because yeah. when you then check it out, it attaches there, yeah. and you can see there was a massive flow still there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the transvalide theory, or the transvalide orogeny, yeah. you know. Mm -mm. Um, this is it was uh, proposed by Marco Andrioli, mm -hmm. and I forgot um, who the other person is, you know. They dated it to 2042. Uh, 2042 and that age is between Bushveld at 2060 and Fred Fort at 2023 mm -hmm. you know um, but when you look at the Agon Agon ages of the shear zones not just here in Rising Star uh, but in different places Zotops there's been a study um, Armageddon different caves in the entire regional area you see that most ages are not necessarily the average um, age of 2042, but they go all the way to about less than 2000, like 1900 and something and so, you know. So I think this regional wide scale deformation was a sort of like 
a res a, a result of everything that had happened earlier, mainly being Freddie Fort and Bushveld. Mm -hmm. You know, it was um, some stuff like an after reaction to all that strain. You know, with the rocks at original scale relaxing. You know, uh, some pressure being removed in some areas and then the result feeding through the entire area over time. I think that is what is happening at that time. Mm -hmm. Hence uh, these shears of different times. But also, um, who's the guy? They have proposed um, new tectonics, you know, mm -hmm. in the area, uh, some faulting. Uh, mainly the Rip Fontaine Fault, um, which is the result of the faults that we have here in this area. Uh, like the one that Lee was talking about, Fault Access map, uh, mapped some of them uh, out uh, on surface. Um, but we have not dated anything that correlates with the new tectonics. It's everything, you know, around two billion years, you know, during the uh, interface of, yeah, Paleo and Meso Proterozoic. So, yeah. Um, so, these shear zones that we see here are going to be important markers to help us understand these blocks. But already I'm getting an idea of what I was saying. That is in no way the natural surface of the cave this one yes yeah, yeah. we seem to be standing on all the trouble and these blocks that we have here will help us understand uh, by using these shear zones as marker beds for the different blocks that have fallen all over and then we get to see um how far then we go uh, and we have an idea of how big this cave was uh, during the mining time and before. see that foliation it's covered by flow stones but if you look closely you can see the foliation mm -hmm. in the oh yeah so there it is um, and you think this is also a block hmm? sorry do you think this is also part of the roof of this yeah big definitely room of this big uh, chamber yes definitely it's uh, actually scary yeah. to see covered yeah so all these Look at that, but did you have flow stone? Right? Are, are you sure? Because so, like, so, check so, it looks like it's one, yeah, look one it. roof and it goes back. Mm, so, we don't know where we are. Yeah, I'm, I'm suspicious okay. because you yes. have these, but you have then the stalactites there. Mm. Okay, so, uh, right. Remember where we on top, where we're standing, mm. you know, that's not the floor. Mm. Right? Yes, yes. Uh, yes. When we're standing on top, we, we are inside a block. Mm. Right? This block was attached to the roof. Mm. And through this block, there was the cave and the flow stones that formed. Mm. So, chances are the block fell before the mining, okay. or as a result of the mining, but they still wanted the flow stones inside the block mm. in inside the caves of the block mm. and they came in and mined in here but i think because remember now we are able to be on top of it okay maybe not necessarily here but you know parts of mm. this block and we came inside it here so i have no doubt that this is this block you know was, was on the roof, was on the roof. Oh, yes right. yeah um do you think it might have fallen before the mining activity? Mm. 
Okay. And then of and then they obviously came in here. Well, I mean, we should be able to see that we... is a question that I'm so, I am the leader of this expedition crew going into territories that I do not know. Uh, you can't get lost here. Mm, says my main man, Dirk, over there. Yeah, see, I don't think, I think, I think this was here. I don't think this came out of the roof. Of the roof? I mean, Jake, this is all one solid wall. Yeah. But if it did fall out of the roof, it might have been like very long ago. Not because of the mining activity, but that's just my guess. I forgot how big it is here. So Dirk, what where are we actually in relation to the rest of the cave? So we are moving away from the so that the big chamber yeah. will end somewhere around here. Okay. And then we are moving basically away from it uh to the south more or less okay and then there's another sinkhole if you follow this um there's a couple of places down there where you can go down a little bit a couple of passages but then if you go up there you, you exit the, the other sinkhole ah, okay. so it's not that far this is basically the the, the last chamber all right <laughs> Exploring. Yeah, no, this is massive. Yeah. This is. You see this. This is obviously the part of the same roof as that side. So they both protect. Keep on this side. That is one solid wall. Really. If you just back there. So to date, the one zero five uh, deposit. We are going to explore a few dating techniques. Um, I'm going to categorize them into two. Those that date the breccia deposits themselves and those, date, those that date the flow stones that are bounding the deposits below and above. So to date the, deposit, uh, the breccia deposits themselves, we can look into one, cosmogenic nuclear burial dating, uh, which helps us date the codes directly. And two, optical, optically stimulated luminescence, which also helps us date the codes directly. And there we can do a single aliquot or multiple grain aliquot. I think those will be the best two methods to try on the Brescia deposits directly. Although an indication based on the fossils is that um, the deposits are much older than the range of OSL dating. Uh, but with cosmogenic burial dating, we should be able to get an age for the quads directly. For the methods that uh, we use to date the speleothems directly, we'll be looking at three possibilities. Firstly, the trusted uranium lead uh, dating, which has an incredible age range from about 100 all the way up to 100,000 years, all the way up to multiple millions of billions. So there's no issue of um, age restrictions for that method but we will also be uh, looking at methods such as the uranium thorium helium dating uh, which is also able to produce ages in the similar age range as uranium lead and these two will be particularly helpful in helpful in the event whereby we can't use uranium thorium dating if uh, the deposits are indeed older than 500,000 as it is suggested by the fossils.